Grace and peace to you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's kind of a hard day, yeah? We kind of threw a zinger at you this week. You know, life is always changing, isn't it? You know, there's moments in our lifetimes, right? There's just so many moments in our lifetimes. Things come, things go, things pass us by. I don't really think God wants us to really have any regrets for any opportunity, any door that he opens up for us to love on one another. And he did that for us with you guys. And we have had zero regrets in being with you guys over the last three plus years. You've loved us. You've been kind to us. You've been good friends to us. You have been a joy, you are a pleasure, and we are better because we've gotten to know you guys, and we've gotten to know you and love you and be loved by you, and our lives are forever better because of that, and I want to thank you for that. You know, it's, we've had a lot of tears in our eyes this last number of weeks. I thought about all this, and I thought how finite life really is. How short it is. You know, when we're little, right? And you're in the back of mom and dad's car, and every five minutes you ask, are we there yet? And then you get over that hump of 50, and you realize life is speeding up and going a whole lot faster. And then the further you progress, the faster it seems to still go. I bring this up because this was what was going on with a few other people that day besides Jesus. We're looking at that story of Jesus' passion this morning on the cross. Every other year, we're really given the option, do we look at his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday? Or do we look at his passion? This morning, I decided that it would be fitting to look at his passion because the children are following in their Sunday school curriculum about the two thieves that died on the cross with Jesus that day. You think about that day, right? I I know none of us were there, but we can imagine in our minds. There were so many people on the scene that day. They were all breathing in the air around them. And some of them were probably thinking that they had many, many, many more years ahead of them. But two of them knew, I'm not saying three, two of them knew that that day would be the day that they would take their final breath on this earth. That day they knew that they would no longer be able to inhale and exhale all that air that most of us Take for granted on a daily basis. And amid all the noise, amid all the chaos of that day, sometimes it's hard for us to lose focus on the one who deserves all of our focus. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. Let's turn our attention to him because that's really where it belongs. Let's focus our attention on the Scripture and breathe in that wondrous Word of God according to the Gospel, according to Luke, chapter 23, verses 26 through 34. I know we just heard it a moment ago, but we're going to go through it again and we're going to take it a little bit slower and look at it a few verses at a time. And we hear this. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind him, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For in these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? 
And then now we go to the gospel that we heard earlier. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with them. And when they came to the place of the skull, they nailed Jesus to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said these famous words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Amid all that noise, amid all that chaos, amid all that large crowd that would have been there atop of Calvary that day, there's really only one man that truly deserves our attention, and that is our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said quite a few things that day. We just heard a few of them, and I put them in there intentionally for us to hear. Because I, there's two other things that Jesus said that day that are far more important, I believe, that stand out among all others. And the first was this in verse 34, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. But they don't know what they're doing. You know, Jesus was really motivated and fueled with forgiveness. We see that here, but we also see it throughout the other gospel accounts. You know, he forgave a paralytic. He forgave the sinful woman who anointed his feet with perfume and with her tears. He refused to judge her. When others wanted to cast stones upon her and kill her for her sins of adultery. He essentially forgave, he didn't condone is the actual word in the Bible, the one who had been married five times, who had met him at the well and she had, was sleeping around with other guys in town. And again, he didn't want to condemn, he would not condemn that woman that the Pharisees wanted to stone to death. Jesus had a heart of forgiveness. And when Peter asked Jesus, Jesus, how many times are we supposed to forgive someone when they wrong us? Seven times? Jesus said, nah, Peter, seven times 70, which was Jesus' way of saying as often as needed. Seven times 70 means the perfection of a lot, meaning a whole bunch, Peter. It's like peeling the layers of an onion. Yeah, keep doing it until you don't need to do it no more. As Jesus was all about forgiveness, right? We as his followers, we should be about forgiveness too. We should also have that same motivation as Christ Jesus to forgive as often as necessary and probably even a whole lot more. And we see the centrality of Jesus' heart here, right? As he's on the cross and he is struggling to breathe that air that we all take for granted to breathe every single day. And in one breath, in one moment of time, Jesus inhales and after he does, he exhales by speaking, Father, forgive them. He chose to forgive those who would never have forgiven him. He chose to forgive those who were ignorant, like the Roman soldiers. You know, they were really just taking orders that day. Yeah, they jeered him too. Yeah, they mocked him too. But in reality, they were kind of ignorant as to what's going on. They were simply obeying the orders that they were given to do by their centurion which was to crucify anybody that came before them. And Jesus also chose to forgive those who blatantly understood full well what they were doing. Like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the law, those who were mocking him beneath his feet. He forgave because he was motivated and fueled with forgiveness. And everyone could see it, especially the two criminals hanging on his right and his left. 
as they understood that they were about to also take their final breath on this earth. Because for them, darkness was closing in. And they knew that it was soon going to be too late. We pick back up where we left off, now in verse 35. And we hear this. The crowds watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, Hey, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above his head that read, King of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, Show you the Messiah, are you? Prove it. Save yourself. (laughs) And while you're at it, save us too. But the other criminal protested. Don't you have any fear of God? Even after you've been sentenced to die? Look, we're guilty as charged, but this guy, he's done absolutely nothing wrong. And then turning his head to look at Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's interesting to consider the duality of these two men, these two friends who were on Jesus' side, one on his right and one on his left. They'd been a band of brothers. Some gospel accounts have us to believe that they were like rebellious zealots. Others would say that they were robbers, that they were thieves. Maybe they were both. Yet, despite despite them being friends, despite them being this band of brothers that had committed these crimes together, they couldn't have been any further apart in that moment. One remained truly unrepentant and unruly, Yet the other was humble and remorseful. One had the tone of evil as though he were invoking the devil trying to bait Jesus and coming down from that cross. The other, though, exhibited a tone of peacefulness as though the Holy Spirit were speaking through him. And yet at the same time with trying to breathe, trying to hold on to every breath he could, to urge his friend in his own way. I was saying, don't you have any humility? Don't you have any reverence for God? We're guilty. He's trying to urge him before we can't breathe anymore. Before we take our final breath. Seek God in repentance. What's kind of interesting when we look at this passage, this repentant, this repentant robber, he really doesn't ever directly ask Jesus, forgive me. He really doesn't ever directly ask the Father, Father God, please forgive me, as we would consider asking forgiveness as we do every Sunday morning in our liturgy. He doesn't confess his sins. But he kind of does confess his sins to his friend by saying, we're guilty as charged. We we deserve our punishment. But with a remorseful heart, he asks Jesus to just even remember him at some future date. When Jesus comes into his future kingdom, he's saying, please remember me then. Don't, Don't forget about me too, Jesus. But in that moment, in the span of a a breath, an inhale and an exhale, Jesus answered his petition as though he was asking God's forgiveness. Without pause, without a moment of reservation, Jesus answered him with the second most powerful statement we hear that morning, that day, today. You're going to be with me in paradise. In one moment, the man is this rebellious robber, doomed to an eternal darkness. But then in the next moment, he was 
remorseful posture caused the word of God incarnate to make him righteous in that moment and destined him to an eternity in light and bliss in paradise. And in that same way, God doesn't make us wait. When we ask the Lord for forgiveness, he forgives us right in the moment. He doesn't say, ah, I'll forgive you at some other later date, if you're good enough. No, God forgives us right then and there. And then he wipes the slate clean as though we had never, ever sinned. God remembers it no more, as Scripture says. And in that moment, when we confess our sins to the Lord, God flips our eternal destination from one of darkness to one of, to one of light, from one of blackness to one of bliss. This moment that we're hearing about, it's equally about Jesus and that robber. For if it were not for that robber, if it weren't for us, for we are that robber, Jesus would not have needed to go to the cross. But we cannot forget about what's the motivation here, and it's Jesus is motivated by forgiveness. Christ died for that man just as he died for us. God gave a gift of grace. He didn't deserve God's forgiveness. He didn't deserve eternity. Neither do we. Yet Jesus made sure that that man's salvation was personal and that it was secured. And it was guaranteed by the word of God himself. As they all struggled to take their final breath. You think about them on the cross. I mean, it's, it's gruesome enough. But what we sometimes fail to understand is how hard it would have been for them to breathe. As they hung there with nails in their hands and nails in their feet, that pain would have caused them to want to shrink down like this. But as they did, that would have pulled on their lungs and it would have been almost impossible to breathe in air and to exhale. So in order to breathe, they would have had to push up with their feet to relieve some of the pain on their hands and able to let some air into their lungs. So they either had the choice of relieving some of the pain or being able to breathe. They couldn't do both. Yet with every breath, they could breathe a little less of that air that we all take for granted. What this helps us to remember is that while we still have breath, it's never too late to ask God for forgiveness. It's never late, too late to ask God for His mercy and His grace. For as long as we have breath, it's never too late to ask Jesus for forgiveness. And in that moment when we do, Jesus will grant it. Jesus does grant it. And in that same way, while we still have breath, we should be willing to forgive anybody who's ever offended us or anybody we think has offended us for anything. Because for as God did for us, we should do for others. As I bring this plane down and get ready to land this message, here's some interesting little factoids. Did you know that on average... Some of us are littler and some of us are bigger. But on average, we as human beings breathe in and out about 20,000 times every single day. And on average, we inhale and exhale, we take about 7.5 million breaths each per year. And if we were to live to an average lifespan of 80, and some of you have already surpassed that, right? That means that we would breathe on average about 600 million times in the course of our lifetimes. And what this tells us is that we have about 600 million moments in the course of our lives to breathe in and to exhale the moment. We have about 600 million moments within our life to seek God and ask Him for forgiveness. 
We have about 600 million moments to be that very same forgiveness that Jesus gave to us upon that cross. Isn't that something? Because we never know when that moment will be gone. We never know when that final breath will come. It took Jesus one breath, just one, to utter, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And it took Jesus just one breath for him to utter, it is finished, which meant the consummation of all of our sins. I can stand up here and say with assurance that I believe that the vast majority of you, if not all of you, because I've gotten to know you, have already with one moment, with one breast, asked God to forgive you. But maybe you have friends who haven't. Let them know before it's too late with a breath to ask, Lord, Lord God, forgive me for I have been ignorant. Forgive me of all my sins. With one breath, urge them to ask, Jesus, forgive me, and please remember me in your heavenly kingdom. Because again, we never know when that final breath will come. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be 80 years from now. So while you still have breath, Do as that robber did. Turn to Jesus. Look at him. And with one breath in your lungs, ask him to bring you into eternity, an eternity filled with paradise and bliss and light. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Sometimes we take life for granted. We take the air in which we breathe for granted. We take your mercy, your grace, your kindness, your love, your forgiveness for granted. Every good gift that you've given us. And sometimes we even take our salvation for granted. Forgive us for all our wrongdoing. Forgive us of our ignorance. Forgive us of our arrogance. Forgive us of every way we've ever missed the mark and sinned against you, one another, and all of heaven. Help us to encourage our friends, Father God, to with one breath ask you to forgive them too so that they may know Jesus' grace, so they may know his mercy, and so they may know his forgiveness also. Help us be bearers of good news with every breath that we take. And in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.